I'm going to show you why the New World Translation is a diabolical, satanic perversion of God's scripture. You with me there? Why the New World Translation is a diabolical, satanic perversion of scripture produced with the main <clears throat> purpose of deceiving people from who the true God is and deceiving people from worshiping Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty. I'm going to give you a few examples. I'm going to compare the modern English version, which is modernized King James, with the New World Translation, particularly in passages that directly relate to the deity of Christ. Are you guys listening? I'm going to show you passages that directly relate to the person of Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ that you can tell have been deliberately mistranslated because the New World Translation is not an unbiased translation of God's Word. It was produced for the express purpose of indoctrinating, brainwashing Joe's witnesses from seeing who the true God is and recognizing Jesus for who he, who he truly is, God in the flesh, because it's diabolical, it's satanic. The organization is influenced by Satan, right? Whether directly or indirectly. You with me there? Let's look at a few. I'm going to compare modern English version, modern English version with the New World Translation. Modern English version is modernized King James. Okay. I'm going to start with John 10, 33. Okay. John 10, 33. Notice it says, the Jews answered him, Jesus, we are not stoning you for a good work, but for you, for blasphemy because you, being a man, claim to be God, capital G. Claim to be God, capital G. Okay, watch here. That's modern English version. Now, notice how <clears throat> the New World Translation renders it. Here it is. Here it is in the New World Translation. Jesus reigns, thank you. If you can post, go ahead. For although, for you, although being a man, make yourself a God, lower case G. Did you catch it? Now, if you're a Jehovah's Witness and you believe the New World Translation is an accurate translation of God's word, you're going to think that the Jews assumed that Jesus was making himself out to be a God, lowercase g. You see that? Pay attention. Notice the pattern. Tell me if it's a coincidence. Acts 20, 28, modern English version. Acts 20, 28. Therefore, the Apostle Paul speaking, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to the entire flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Folks, did you catch it? God has blood. This passage clearly affirms the hypostatic union. This passage clearly affirms the hypostatic union, meaning that in the one person of Jesus Christ, there are two distinct natures, that Jesus possesses the nature of God and the nature of man. Now notice, God shed his blood, and it was by the blood of God that he purchased the church. This refers to Jesus being God in nature and human in nature, two distinct natures united in one person, right? You see it? Not if you're reading the New World Translation. New World Translation, the congregation of God, which he purchased with the blood of his own son. Do you see the difference? The blood of his own son. Number one, the word son is not in the Greek New Testament. The word son does not appear in the Greek manuscripts that even the Jehovah's Witnesses translate from. They inserted the word son to make it seem as if Paul was referring to God purchasing the church with the blood of Jesus, his son. But the word son, we use, we use is not in the Greek. You guys see that? The word son is not in the Greek. We use, we use is not in the Greek. It's to idiu, to idiu, right? To idiu, right? Which is literally of his own. Medic, pay attention. The Greek words are to idiu, 
To idiu means literally of his own. So the blood of his own, meaning his own blood. The Byzantine textual tradition, which forms the majority of our Greek witnesses, actually read kuriu ke theu, kuriu ke theu, calling Jesus Lord and God, Lord and God. That's the majority reading, what's known as the Byzantine textual tradition, the Byzantine text type, which formed the majority of our Greek witnesses, doesn't read God, it reads Lord and God. Lord and God. Kuriu ke thiu. It's right there. Kuriu ke thiu. And it says dia, dia, through to idiu ematos. To idiu ematos. Through the his own blood. Pardon my butchering of the Greek. Did I confuse you guys? Or are you following with me? The Orthodox Church. They follow what's known as the Byzantine textual tradition. Do you guys know that the Greek Orthodox Church, I said, I said this yesterday, do not follow the Hebrew Masoretic textual tradition of the Old Testament. They follow the Greek version, the Greek version of the Old Testament, which we call the Septuagint. Did you know that? The Greek Orthodox follows what's called the Byzantine textual tradition of the Greek New Testament. When it comes to the New Testament, they follow what's known as the majority text of the Byzantine textual tradition, which forms the majority of our Greek witnesses of the New Testament. The reason why that's important is because the Byzantine textual tradition in Acts 20:28 20, reads, Lord and God, Lord and God, that it was Jesus our Lord and God that purchased the church with his own blood. Okay, now let's get back to the issue. Romans 9.5 in the modern English version, modernized King James see, says, to whom belong the patriarchs and from whom, according to the flesh, notice Jesus has two natures again, according to his flesh, his human nature, right? He's an Israelite. He comes from Israel. And from whom, according to the flesh, is human nature, is Christ, who is overall God forever blessed. Amen. Did you catch it? Jesus, again, has two natures. In his human nature, according to his flesh, he's an Israelite. But then he has another nature which makes him supreme over all creation because in regards to that other nature, he is the God who is forever blessed. Amen. Do you guys see it? Jesus is the God who's forever blessed, and because he's God, he reigns supreme over all creation. But then he has a nature that's flesh, a nature that's human, and according to that human nature, according to his flesh, he's an Israelite. But now let's see how the Jehovah Witness render that passage. Watch here. Here's the Jehovah Witness perversion of Romans 9.5. I hope I'm not boring you with this. I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you're being educated as the Holy Spirit saves me from error and guides me into all truth so that all of us will be guided into the truth of God. Now notice the Jehovah Witness rendering of Romans 9.5. Notice the Jehovah Witness rendering of Romans 9.5. And from them the Christ descend according to the flesh, period, full stop. God, who's overall, be praised forever. Amen. Did you see what they did with the Greek? Did you see what they did with the Greek? Instead of identifying Jesus as the God who is supreme over all, the God who's to be praised forever, they put a period before that sentence so that Jesus is not identified as God, but that God here is someone separate from Jesus. You see that? Before I move on, you see what they did? Folks, are you seeing a pattern? Are you seeing a pattern when it comes to Jesus Christ and their perverted Bible? Any passage which identifies Jesus as God Almighty in the flesh, they either translate in such a way where he's no longer described as God, 
but as a God, a lesser God, or interpret it where God and Christ are separated from one another. Are you seeing the pattern here? This one's really going to upset you. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Philipp Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. If you look at the Greek, it's clear. The Father bestowed on Jesus the status that is above every position and authority. The name which is above every name. Okay, that's what the Greek says. Now let's compare the New World Translation. The newer translation of Joe's Witnesses, Philippians 2.9, watch here. And kindly gave him the name that is above every other name. Did you catch it? They inserted the word other again. So God didn't give Jesus the name above every name. He gave him the name that's above every other name. They inserted the word other. Ah, <whistles> uh, but it's even worse than that. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, modern English version, modernized King James. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, who is Jesus Christ? As we await the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow. Paul is explicit. Jesus Christ, when he appears, that will be the appearance of our great God and Savior. Our great God and Savior is Jesus Christ. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will soon appear. Ah, oh, but wait. Here is the New World Translation. The appearance of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh-oh. <whistles> the appearance of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. You see what they did? They didn't translate it as our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, but the manifestation of the great God and of our Savior Jesus Christ in order to distinguish Jesus from being the great God. Do you see it? God willing, in future sessions, if the Holy Spirit gives me health, and the Holy Spirit gives me the holiness to delight his heart, and provides for me, I'll go into the grammatical issues demonstrating that the Jehovah Witness Bible shamelessly perverted these passages. Okay? Hebrews 1.8, modern English version. But to the Son, he says, but to the Son, God the Father says this to the Son. But to the Son, he, God the Father says, your throne, O God, lasts forever and ever. Here, the author of Hebrews has the Father glorifying, praising, and honoring the Son as the God who rules forever. Now, you know what's beautiful about the Greek? In Greek, it says, your throne, ha theos. Your throne, the God. So the Father identifies Jesus as the God who rules forever, ha theos. Ah, but wait. Here's the New World Translation. But about the Son, he says, God is your throne forever and ever. God is your throne forever and ever. Wait, wait, wait. Did the Father say to Jesus, your throne, O God, is forever and ever? Or did the Father say to Jesus, God is your throne. Your throne is of God. I am your God who gives you authority to rule. Are you catching the pattern here? If they did it to one passage, we'll say, ah, uh, coincidence. Two passages, yeah. But it's a repeated pattern. Repeated pattern that any and every passage that identifies Jesus Christ as God Almighty, God in an absolute sense, they manage to butcher the meaning of those passages. It's a repeated pattern. Second Peter 1, modern English version. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who have received the faith as precious as ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter, like Paul, identifies Jesus Christ as our God and Savior. Here it is.
modern English version. Peter, who is Jesus? Peter says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is our God and Savior. Our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not according to the New World Translation. Here it is. New World Translation. Through the righteousness of our God and the Savior, Jesus Christ. Through the righteousness of our God and the Savior, Jesus Christ. Did you see the repeated pattern of the Jehovah Witness Bible to pervert the meaning of these passages which directly identify Jesus Christ as God Almighty in the flesh? Now you tell me it's a coincidence. Is it a coincidence? Are you seeing the diabolical nature of this perversion? That it's satanic in its origin. So why would the society do that? Very easy to answer. In order to indoctrinate, brainwash, and mislead Jehovah's Witnesses from discovering the identity of Jesus Christ. Who he truly is. It's not a coincidence that they pervert the passages that directly address who the true God is and identify Jesus for who he truly is, God in the flesh.